My name is Marty Kaplan. I'm the director of the Norman Lear Center here at the Annenberg School. If you don't know about what the Lear Center is up to, uh, I invite you to learcenter.org to find out. There are lots and lots of really exciting projects. And uh, one of them is, is the reason that we're here today. Uh, the Lear Center is very interested in the impact of media on society. And the question arises, well, how do we know if there is an impact on society or on individuals? There is certainly a, a field of uh, study in communication, but new technology is changing the resources to study these kinds of things. And so uh, we have now a new partnership with uh, two foundations, the Gates Foundation and the Knight Foundation to pursue these issues. The project is called Measuring Media Impact and Engagement. And we're really excited about ramping it up. And uh, we're gonna be working with uh, a lot of collaborators, both here at the school, across the university, and, and really across the world. And as we do this work, one of the things that we wanted to do was to bring here people who were real leaders in this area, people who have been studying, for example, audiences, or whatever we call the people who used to be known as the audience. And uh, one of them, uh, it's uh, our pleasure to have here today. Uh, I'm excited uh, both because of his work in the area of audiences, which is you know, sufficiently a rare thing to be able to find, in addition, his work is, his research is strategically chosen. He does stuff that when you find things out, that data can make a difference in policy. He testifies before Congress and the FCC. He's very interested in the policy implications, and it affects the conversations we have about them. And then, in addition, he's also interested, and I love this, in the sociology and politics of the different communities that deal with this. So that, for example, in the world of ratings, uh, there are people who work in advertising agencies and in uh, networks, all of whom are communities with their own habits and vested interests. And to understand that as an aspect of doing the, the number crunching uh, and the, the policy side, that's, that's a real uh, uh, triple threat. Uh, his most recent book, which I highly recommend in this area, is called Audience Evolution. And so uh, please join me in welcoming uh, the Fordham School of Business professor, Phil Napoli. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, everyone, for, for having me here. Although, uh, I'm a sucker for any time I can get a couple of days away from New Jersey in the winter, so uh, I'm really appreciative of this little reprieve. Uh, my wife is very jealous. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, I'm going to talk today. Um, this is the, the sort of the lengthy title of my talk, Audiences as Consumers, Audiences as Citizens, New Tools for Measuring Media Engagement and Social Impact. Uh, and as Marty mentioned, he, as he told me a few weeks back about this project that was ramping up here, and it got me uh, very interested because it does really intersect um, with a lot of what I've been doing over the years. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about that first to sort of um, sort of contextualize a bit um, the, the sort of the perspective I bring on some of this. Uh, first, as, as you mentioned, I've been doing some work on, on audiences and really on the notion of what we might call the institutionalized audience. That is, how do different institutions make sense of and conceptualize the audience? Don't laugh at those, at those covers, by the way. I saw someone <laughs> snickering. That, my publisher clearly hates me. Uh, and, um, but the worst part was, this was the first horrible one, and then my wife designed a great one for the second book, and they said, no, we don't want to have inconsistency uh, in the design, so we need two crappy covers. Uh, so anyway, uh, just 
I couldn't let that go. Uh, I think I'm still bitter. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so so yeah, so so and, and there are the, a lot of these issues of, of of measurement and how information and data about audiences are used in decision making is something uh, that's interested me quite a bit. Uh, but I've also been working in the policy space on on related in some ways measurement issues. And I hope the way that these are related will become clear in, in a moment. Uh, so for example, some of you may remember a number of years back the FCC went down this path of trying trying to develop um, what they call the diversity index, a, tr a way of trying to measure um, the diversity of media markets that could inform and guide, in particular, media ownership policy making. And, and, and that was actually you know, a byproduct of, of, of some work a lot of us were doing in this, in this space in, in years before that. And it went in some directions that a lot of us were not particularly happy about. Uh, so a few years back I worked with an organization called the Center for American Progress to, to, to try to develop some alternative approaches, really convening actually the same, sort of this, what, you're, what you're doing, Marty, sort of a, a group of people from all sorts of, dis of disparate backgrounds to try to come up with a, uh, a, a viable alternative that it turned out uh, not only did nobody like it, which made me think maybe it's actually good because whether you were for or against media consolidation, you didn't seem to like you know, where our, our, our measurements were going. But more important, it actually got, us, uh, got me in particular interested in a related issue because part of what made this so difficult was the issue of obtaining and gaining access to the, the the wide range of, 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 re of relevant commercial data sources that are essential to, um, to doing this kind of work. Uh, and not only, it wasn't something that only we ran into, it was even something that the FCC itself was running into, gaining access to data that they knew was out there, but gaining the kind of access necessary to really construct these robust portraits of of media markets and essentially the functioning of individual media systems. Uh, so that led me down a, a path le that I ended up working with an organization called the Social Science Research Council on a program called Necessary Knowledge for a Democratic Public Sphere. And as the title suggests, a big part of that was about trying to better inject the kind of data and information and research that could inform policy making uh, that could impact um, the structure and performance of our of our public sphere. So all these things sort of get tied right into, in many ways, I think, these issues of media engagement and social impact because all of them, t in, in, in different ways, we're trying to, uh, you know, are, are providing potential tools to get at um, this interesting challenge, which is how do we effectively evaluate different kinds of media and enterprises in terms of whether or not they are having particular social impact, are they engaging audiences, communities, users, whatever the terminology we decide is, is, is most appropriate. Uh, so, uh, and, a, and to ground this also, there is a sort of, and I won't get into it in too much detail, this sort of lar you know, large and interesting body of literature on this notion of the audience as citizen versus the audience as consumer. And a lot of it has been you know, targeted at the, in this realm of, of policy making. And what does policy making look like if it considers audiences more broadly beyond the notion of consumers of media and really thinks of them as citizens, as publics, et cetera. Uh, and so I'm going to try to distill some of that literature down in, into some basic uh, components, uh, and I don't know if I hit on all of them. Uh, I'm sure folks here might be able to, to even chime in uh, with additional dimensions of this. But at the most basic level, it does mean going beyond exposure. And I'm going to talk about this notion of exposure uh, a bit today, and how it you know contrasts with some of the other ways we might think about audiences or citizens, for that matter. Uh, but beyond that notion of sort of a passive exposure to content, uh, which can include, for example, going beyond exposure could mean uh, the extent to which an audience is cultural and informational needs and interests are being met. Uh, the other part of what I've been working on as of late that I didn't mention before and actually collaborated with, with, uh, with the Annenberg School on this was some work that came out of the Knight Commission's report on the information needs of communities. The FCC decided they wanted a, a wide-ranging literature review on how community information needs are should be defined and how they are being met by um, um, you know by by our media system. Uh, and that was a, a project we did last year. Uh, is is Tatiana here still? She's still a student, or is she gone? Uh, Katya. Uh, so still here, yeah. Work with Katya, work with Ernie, uh, and uh, and as is the often the case in the realm of doing policy research, it landed on the FCC's desk, and they said thank you very much, and absolutely nothing has happened since. Uh, but you know, we worked hard on it. Uh, but anyway, um, 
Second, uh, the issues of the many roles of the audience in the media ecosystem, and I've just you know, a couple of these here: share as participants, as producer, etc. Again, taking us beyond the notion of audiences as consumers, uh, and then of course into the wide-ranging realm of potentially relevant effects that content might might have. Uh, so these you know these are some some basic elements of what we mean when we really start trying to move beyond the notion of the audience as consumer. Uh, but in fact, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today uh, is derived from the work I've been doing as of late in the audience measurement space, which has, you know, historically needless to say, really oriented itself around that basic notion of audience as consumer. Uh, and one of the things we've been talking about trying to understand within the context of this larger project is how some of that might be essentially repurposed to address broader issues uh, that you know reflect you know notions of, of 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 the audience as citizen and how information needs and, and impact et cetera uh, could be considered. Uh, so anyway, as, as a starting point, and this, and this comes from the uh, from from the audience evolution book, uh, I think it's useful to think about us today as being in in the commercial space what I call a post-exposure audience marketplace, where exposure has a much more limited value or much more limited influence in terms of as, in his role as a as a currency so to speak and is being but but remains as, as this is meant to illustrate really does remain at the core it does not go away it's not irrelevant because it is indeed the the, 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 the starting point for a lot of these other concepts which as we're go, I'm going to talk about are starting to gain traction uh, as as alternative sources of, of value so to speak and when I use that term value again I'm going to be talking about it primarily within the context of of advertising supported media but I, you know within this project I think what's interesting is that we can sort of think about that notion of value and so many other broader richer more you know uh, politically resonant socially resonant ways uh, so I, what I tried to do is model, you know, essentially, all, and this is sort of meant to be sort of uh, a process. Uh, the, the, the dimensions of, of, of being in a, a member of an audience ranging from the earliest stages of awareness about content through which then in theory can potentially translate into interest, uh, which then can lead to exposure, and then it gets complicated. Um, Again, I, I tried to put these in some sort of sequential way. I put two concepts there, attentiveness and loyalty, as sort of offshoots of this notion of exposure. Because if you look in the, in the, in the measurement space, essentially measures of attentiveness, that is how, how, often, how much you're paying attention, or loyalty, that is how frequently do you consume some kind of media content, are typically derived from exposure measures that are, that are, that are being captured. So attentiveness might really often be just simply how much time do you spend Consuming it, how much how much how much exposure do you have? And loyalty would be the frequency. How often do you go back to it? Uh, but then we go beyond that, uh, and potentially we get to the level of we reach appreciation and emotional response. Couldn't fit that all in the box there. Uh, and then possibly recall and attitude change, and then ultimately some kind of behavioral response. Now, uh, as you'll see there, I have this sort of umbrella term. Uh, Engagement, which I know came up today as well, and uh, and we're going to try to tackle a little bit today. But what I tried to do there was essentially map what I was seeing in my research at the time, were all of the ways, all of the multitude of ways in which various entities in the media space, whether it was advertisers or content providers or measurement firms, were operationalizing this notion of engagement, and it's it's included one or all of of all of these things. So it can even include some dimensions of basic exposure like attentiveness or loyalty in the online space uh, you know there will be of course you know something like stickiness is often taken as a as an engagement measure in and of itself uh, or appreciation as I'm going to talk today about some of these social media analytics uh, and emotional response or things that can be captured uh, and, and considered part of engagement as well and then of course recall and attitude change uh, and then even, of course, various types of behavioral responses, which can range from anything from, of course, in the realm of product purchasing behaviors, but perhaps to uh, sharing activities or social media activity, et cetera. But so, and I'm, so I don't have a, uh, I don't know, so I know because that question is going to come. What should engagement mean? I, this, this, this was not meant to answer that. It was just meant to map what the, 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 the media sector was, was, was including within their various notions uh, of engagement. But in this, you know, in this sort of post-exposure audience marketplace, what's interesting is that whereas the value has all traditionally lied there, um, there are a number of forces at work that are making that no longer 
viable. That is, as that, 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 that can be or should be the only source of value. And I think for all of us who probably think that everyone should be thinking about audiences in a more sophisticated way, this is sort of a promising and an, an exciting thing. Uh, so what I've tried to do here is sort of describe you what I see as these opposing forces uh, in, the, in terms of this realm of audience measurement and valuation. The things that are moving us beyond exposure, uh, this will become clear a bit. Uh, what I mean by audience, dark matter. Uh, this idea that there is all sorts of audience attention, audience exposure out there that in the contemporary media environment no longer can be effectively captured by the existing measurement systems. I think it's the one thing I remembered from my freshman astronomy class, what dark matter was. It's that stuff that we know is there, but we can't actually you know, quantify it effectively. Uh, interactivity, uh, creating, and, and I'll, I'll actually elaborate all those in separate slides in a minute. Uh, but these are some particular things that provide not only the necessity to move beyond exposure, but also tools to facilitate that. And one of the arguments I make at Audience Evolution is that we can o this, can, this kind of thing can only happen when there is both the opportunity and also a sufficient um, challenge to the status quo from an economic standpoint. We were talking yesterday about, for example, in the 1980s there was an effort to fund a alternative system to the Nielsen ratings called television audience assessment. And it was, the idea was that it could actually measure not only exposure but appreciation and demonstrate a linkage between appreciation for the programming and, and uh, product purchasing behaviors and, 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 and things of that sort, if I remember the details correctly. And the problem was, and, and Marty asked that question, well, why, why did it fail? And the answer was very simple. It was a solution to something that no one thought was a problem yet. Now this is a, you know, because the status quo was working just fine, and maybe that would have been better, but you need massive disruption to, to, the, for the, uh, to the status quo. And that's certainly what we've seen as of late uh, in this environment of extreme fragmentation uh, where it's becoming more and more difficult to, to rely purely on the monetization, so to speak, of exposure. That isn't to say that people have abandoned, that these in various institutions have abandoned that uh, model by any stretch of the imagination. So we have a variety of efforts ongoing so, ranging from things as simple as increasing sample sizes to, tra to traditional sample-based measurement systems panel-based measurement systems, to what we see in the online space, is the realm of hybrid measurement, where you, 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 you meld panel data with server log data as a way to try to compensate for the inability to, 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 to generate and maintain samples that are sufficiently large to capture the distribution of audience attention online, uh, to what we're seeing, uh, you know, getting to this issue of fragmentation across platforms, so the cross platform campaign ratings that the Nielsen Company has recently rolled out that can actually give you a rating for a television program, for example, across online uh, and, and traditional television platforms. And then the recent announcement by Arbitron and Comscore of a five platform measurement system. But again, the reason I put these here is because they all are still operating under that basic notion of trying to maintain uh, an effective way of measuring audiences' exposure. So they're innovations in, in many ways, but in, in, at, the, at that core level, they really still are about um, capturing exposure and, and nothing else, uh, and with the idea that that would continue to serve as the primary source of audience value. Um, now, so getting into what I mean by dark matter, just some examples, and, 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 and some of these might, you might find eye-opening. I know I did as I, as I, as I learned about this. Uh, as much as 15% of, of television viewing is on unmeasured platforms. Uh, and so there is that constant um, catch-up that measurement systems need to, uh, to be involved in. Of course, now uh, it's, it's mobile devices and tablets in particular that, are, 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 that the measurement folks are, are trying to effectively capture. Um, and to put this into more concrete sense, Nielsen reports ratings for approximately 80 of the over 500 television networks that are in operation. So over 400 television networks do not have ratings. Their, their audiences are too small. Now the interesting thing is though, is that only accounts for, that, that those 420 or so um, combined only account for about 25% of television viewing, but nonetheless, roughly 25% of our total exposure to television program is on what we would call unmeasured networks. Uh, and basically only the top 102 programs uh, have the full scope of detailed ratings that, uh, that Nielsen can provide. You go into the radio space, uh, even radio, old medium, only about half of the over 13,000 U.S. radio stations uh, have ra ratings reports from Arbitron. Most of them are in, are in areas that they uh, fall, they're, they're, they don't even consider worth trying to, to, to measure. Uh, in, the, in the magazine space, MRI measures readership of 232 
uh, of over 5,000 magazines. Uh, and if you look online, and you know, I pulled this number from somewhere. God knows if 180 million is, is anywhere close to the accurate number of, 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 of websites in operation. But the bottom line is, even the, by the current systems, it's about 100,000 websites that can be uh, effectively measured, even via these hybrid uh, panel sample base uh, panel and, and uh, server log systems uh, by um, by the you know the, the predominant measurement firms. So that's what I mean by dark matter, lots of it. Now then, in terms of, of on the other side, where the drivers towards looking in different directions, the traditional model is, of course, this, uh, where basically audience exposure is what the content provider learns about. But in, in this increasingly interactive media space, everything ranging from search activities to appreciation to participation to production and response, all of that can be captured via the ways that we, in which we can engage with media in, in, in so many more interactive ways. And I'm going to boil that down in particular uh, into one in particular uh, platform in a few minutes. But just to give you an example, there are now, uh, going, you know, you, we can link back to that model before, all sorts of organizations that are looking to capture uh, different dimensions of that, uh, of that, of that model, We're ranging from awareness and interest uh, to engagement and, and recall. Um, has anyone ever played, uh, gone to www.rewardtv.com? Anyone familiar with that? This is an example I use with my students. Uh, it's, a, it's a website that you go to and it will ask you to take part in quizzes about TV shows. And you'll see how many you can get right. And the more questions about tonight, last night's episode you get right, you can win points that you can redeem to potentially win prizes, et cetera. Uh, and it's actually part of a Nielsen measurement system designed to measure our recall of the programs that we watch. And that's their measure of engagement. That, they call that engagement. So if you, can rem if you can answer 10 questions correctly about the show, maybe even about some of the commercials that aired during the show, that's an engagement metric that indeed some networks are using as part of their providing make goods and, and guarantees. Uh, just like the traditional model has been, well, if we don't deliver this audience, we will provide make goods and give you credits towards the difference. Uh, some networks have entered into contracts where they're using that very basic, and again, some of you are probably saying, that is not engagement. Engagement is a much more complex, it must be a much more complex phenomenon than can you answer 10 questions about last night's television show correctly, but yet, you know, that that has gained traction in the marketplace tells, to me, is very telling that that is the amount of sort of disruption at work here, the willingness to essentially grasp on uh, to all sorts of alternatives that might prove to be, to be viable. And you should probably asking, you know, I know there's a, a mixed audience here, but the, the, you know, the social scientists in the room are saying, well, who would actually go and do this? And how could they possibly be representative of the population as a whole? Who would bother to go and play rewardtv.com? And how can that be possibly representative of the television audience as a whole? Uh, and that raises all sorts of other issues that fascinate me these days where it just seems that the, um, the quantity of the data you could gather is increasingly capable of outweighing questions about quality. And, and, and that's, that's sort of, to me, one of the sort of, we were talking about big data before with Ernie. That's sort of the larger, I think, philosophical question uh, that arises as we start thinking about some of these issues. Uh, emotional response, companies that do that as well. Uh, the Q-score folks, have, you know, is, is uh, still work in that area. Behavioral responses. So any of those spots on the chain now, there are measurement organizations trying to quantify it in ways that can make it potentially monetizable uh, for, for content providers. Uh, I, as I see it, it's, it's a, quite a number of different types of hammers out there um, looking for nails. That is, there's, you know, they, there are these tools that are being developed and um, we were talking before, now I'm going to forget the name, but there's a company, I, I, wanted, I had a conversation with the executive at a company called NanoCrowd. And this is a good example. This is a company that has essentially developed a way of de determining what movie you'll, people will like based on the words they use to describe films that they have seen. So it's not about, you know, so it's not the Netflix model of, of how many stars you give it, but it's just scraping the social media and blogosphere space for the words that are most frequently associated with certain films to, to describe them, and do those words appear in the descriptions of other types of films. And apparently it's a very good predictive tool for the old, if you like this, you'll also like that. Uh, and literally it, it turned out that this, uh, the folks at this company were just looking around trying to find out what market there might be for this. They developed it, and probably for some other reason entirely, but with no particular solution to a particular problem in mind, or at least not this one, but they're li just looking for possible applications for this. And that's what's interesting about this space now, is there are, there are applications that are being used, or they are trying to figure out ways that they could be applied 
uh, that they weren't necessarily originally designed for. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's why, you know, I think this analogy is, 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 is relevant here. The other thing that's important, I think, to understand this current space right now is how often on the consumer end, uh, and I've found this in some research I've done more recently for Time Warner, when I've gone out and I've been asking uh, in particular uh, various types of, of content providers, uh, whether in the television space and in, in different media spaces, um, you know, understanding how they behave and what they're thinking as consumers and users of all these different kinds of audience information systems. And the, the theme that emerged over and over again was they emphasized that they, they see themselves as researchers even in the business of needing to tell compelling stories. So, so some representative quotes. Uh, I, I must have heard this exact same thing told to me by four or five different people. If we don't have the rating story to tell, we have to talk about audience quality. Um, and so again, the idea is, is, is fewer and fewer of the content options out there have a rating, and by a rating story to tell, we really mean an exposure story to tell. And we can't, we can't essentially get, you know, capture sufficient value from our audience purely on the basis of, of, of their size, which is really what exposure emphasizes, or uh, we, increasingly we hear discussion within the space of the rating story <coughs> versus the engagement story. And so if we don't have a rating story to tell, we want to be able to have an engagement story to tell. Now again, for, as, for, you know, from a social science standpoint, you start hearing about data and storytelling and you, know, um, you, you start to get a little nervous. But you know, I think this is also the reality uh, of, of the audience marketplace. Uh, what's interesting then uh, in this environment that we see now where we are looking beyond exposure, where the, all these institutions are looking beyond exposure uh, to al alternative sources of audience value, uh, is that it actually takes us back to some of the early days of audience research in this country. Uh, a couple quotes from, from well-known researchers in our field, some really founding fathers in many ways. Here's one, the first one. Uh, and these go back to radio. We have lost sight of our primary purpose for measuring radio programs. What we really uh, want to know is not how many persons are listening. The real information that we desire is how much influence the program in question is exerting. Now, in this case, it's on sales, but this is, again, with this project, what's interesting is we could take these questions and go well beyond issues of sales, which <coughs> aren't really all that interesting. Uh, or, but again, you look at, at Paul Lazarsfeld, who was really one of the pioneers in terms of true academic industry partnerships in the early days of audience research in the radio space. He even worked in the realm of motion picture research a bit. Uh, and it, basically, he saw that entire industry move in a direction that he, was, he didn't expect it to go. And, and certainly, his early research uh, wasn't, wasn't focused on. As he, as he mentioned here, questions of preference of radio research have been almost discarded in favor of actual listening figures. Uh, but this is not necessarily the best solution. It may be just as important to know that a person likes a certain program. All that early research that came out of the Radio Research Bureau really looked at a wider variety of dimensions of, you know, in, involving the relationship between radio and its audience. And yet the way that that, that industry developed was one in which all of that sort of fell by the wayside and the focus was on the much more narrow issue of what is that size of that audience. And note here, it, and at this point in time, we're not even gotten to issues of composition yet. We're not even at the point later, really more in the 1980s, where that second major transition took place and it was about the demographics of who was exposed. This is just, this is just the, raw, the raw numbers era. But now we are in many ways you know, circling back uh, and, you know, and have both the tools and the incentive uh, to understand audiences uh, in more robust ways. Uh, and so in particular, I want to talk a bit about some research I've been doing on uh, social media analytics. In particular, in this case, I've been focusing on the role that social media is playing in the realm of, of, the t of television. Uh, not surprisingly, many of the social media analytics providers have been focusing on the television industry, trying to gain traction there as an alternative or a supplementary currency, so to speak. Uh, not surprising because that's where the largest amount of, of, of ad dollars really are. Uh, so here's some examples from the trade press of you know, this, which I, was the thing that struck me is there is this incredible uh, sort of excitement or you know, enthusiasm for this notion that there's a massive transition taking place. Uh, the idea that it would actually become a, a replacement for traditional Nielsen ratings is very interesting. Uh, the reality is, of course, somewhat different. You, you, as I was talking about, you encounter a lot of skepticism amongst the users of this stuff. And there's, with good reason, as some of the data I'll show you will uh, indicate. Uh, but it's an incredibly, at this point in time, incredibly crowded space uh, that's changing day to day. Um, 
some of you may have heard, for example, one of the major providers in this area, Bluefin, was just purchased by uh, Twitter. Social Guide was just purchased by Nielsen. So there's all these providers of social media-based audience information out there. And uh, probably a lot of you are, are familiar, just real basic, you know, the basic process is sort of algorithmically driven web scraping of, 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 of a defined set of platforms and the appropriate words are associated with the appropriate programs and essentially top 10 and top 25 lists can be produced just like with traditional Nielsen data. What are the most talked about shows online? Uh, what are the most liked shows? That can be, that can be accomplished. They, they, they claim uh, that is being able to identify sentiment associated with the words that are being used. Um, so this is, this is the space that I started looking into a bit more deeply for the, for the Time Warner project. Uh, and it's interesting, of course, because big picture wise, if we start to um, project ahead to an environment where indeed this sort of social media activity becomes a key driver of cultural production, uh, there's you know, all sorts of changes that could result. You know, we, we are certainly are talking about um, a model where we, we instantly have a greater diversity of success criteria. That is, if you could succeed via the traditional exposure story or you could succeed via the social media engagement story, then suddenly that creates more opportunities, uh, a couple of different criteria by which content can potentially be economically viable. Uh, here's a quote from one of the, my interview subjects for, for the project. Lots of people are trying to show lots of different types of success. So there's the potential that this really can unlock untapped sources of audience value and could indeed promote greater diversity of content. On the other hand, and I s stole this from that old chestnut from the uh, Lear Center from Europe's back, more or less tyranny of the uh, 18 to 49s. Um, that is, it's possible there are some data that suggests that this exact same demographic that has been uh, overvalued by advertisers for so long, if it turns out that they're exactly the same people who just are constantly on, on Twitter talking about television programs, then this could reinforce that or create some other very narrow demographic grouping that uh, develops disproportionate influence in this space. Uh, so maybe the tyranny of tweeters is what we are uh, looking to on the horizon. Uh, and, but and the end result would be the potential for the overvaluing and thus the creation of content for this very active minority that is, again, not necessarily representative of, of the population as a whole. So these are some of the bigger picture issues that arise in, in this particular direction that the measurement of audiences is, is, is evolving in. Uh, but one of the things that came out of this work was an opportunity to work directly with uh, a large media buying agency in New York uh, who it turned out shared my interest in this and wanted to do some comparative analysis. So this is sort of a real basic question. They just wanted to know, you know, they, uh, what were the differences between some of the leading providers of these data? For me, what was interesting is the, big, uh, is the bigger picture of, you know, what, at what stage in this evolution of, of these kind of audience information systems are we at? Um, in terms of whether or not these things are giving us any kind of consistent portrait of the media audience. So uh, they were able to obtain for me a, a small amount of data to do sort of a pilot analysis of a, of a, of a one week time period. Again, three, three services provided us with data. Um, we analyzed prime time, regularly scheduled programming. Uh, our unit of analysis was the individual program rather than the individual telecast. And that gets important as, as we learn because, my god, and I, I, was, I was just hanging out in my room last night. Diners, drive-ins, and dives just keeps running one after the other, after the other. And some shows literally will air 20 times, 30 times in a given week on a network. So uh, it, if, you, if you have the individual telecast as a unit of analysis, uh, it, it complicates things because there's a lot of variety there. So we were actually, it's the entire program, no matter how many times it ran, that was our unit of analysis. Uh, and so we were able to obtain data not only on the volume, but on the valence, and that is, you know, not only how many people mentioned a particular program, but how much they, in theory, liked it or didn't like it. Uh, and these these services issue rankings reports, just like traditional Nielsen rankings reports, on the basis of these criteria. And then we were also able to obtain uh, Nielsen data, it's just as a basis for comparison, to see what the portrait of the television audience looks like by old versus new uh, measurement systems. Just to give you a sense, so this was a, and this is you know very very basic. Um, it would be fun to get a hold of a lot more data and do some more sophisticated things. Um, 
but uh, I, I was just thrilled that they were willing to let us do this with their data, and especially because then we were we, we provided this this presentation to the American Association of Advertising Agencies, uh, to the Council for Research Ex Excellence. So we were able to sort they were they were comfortable with letting us present these findings to a lot of different industry associ associations that were essentially pondering what role this should play in their uh, in their day to day work. Uh, but if you look, so for example, um, the, the percentage is essentially the percentage of overlap. How many within the top 25 programs appear on both lists? And this is, you know, and so placement is a whole other issue. This is just are they are there commonalities in their top 25? And if you go across that first row, you see, for example, between. Bluefin and General Sentiment and Trender, these are three of, of the major providers in this area. You've got 40% agreement. That level of agreement drops when you get to Nielsen measures, both at the household level and the 12 to 34 level. Uh, and then the next row, you see, so really essentially the services all agree with each other in about the 30 to 40, uh, you know, 35 to 40% range. Lower levels of agreement in general with the, with the Nielsen data, not surprising. Um, but to me, this is where things get particularly interesting. If we then change the unit of analysis uh, to uh, the sentiment, zeros. <laughs> so now again, what, is, what, what does this tell us? It essentially tells us, even, even these numbers, I think these are relatively low levels of agreement, because we have to remember this too. And I have different, I didn't put the, the, the graphs where I tried to graph out the, the in a more sophisticated way, but these are the top 25 programs. So if there's going to be anywhere where you're going to see agreement, when you, when you look at measurement systems, generally the pattern is the, the agreement amongst the most popular content options uh, is higher and then it tails off. So if even within the top 25, the agreement le the levels are this low, um, and indeed we saw this, we saw this, that they didn't necessarily even agree on the number one program or the number two program. Uh, so at, at, the, at those very basic levels, these are fundamentally different. And if you, if you look at the actual raw data, which we're able to look at as well, um, you know, what, uh, you know, a program that was number one for the week in the Bluefin data had 300,000 or so mentions. And a program that was number one in the Trender data had 1.2 million mentions. So, and that, you know, it just, it, it illustrates massive methodological differences between these, cons these mechanisms. They'd all sort of claim they're doing the same thing, but they're doing it in such very different ways that they're providing portraits of the audience that to me have very little commonality with each other. It's not like the old days of, you know, when Nielsen and Arbitron were both doing TV, and you'd see 10, 12 percent differences. These are, these are massive differences in, in, in what they're, what they're showing. Question? So the differences that you're seeing in, in these numbers, in this case of volume, it's literally in the kind of the, the count of, you know, how they take the raw content, turn that into a mention, and the count of the mentions? So no, th this number is just the list and the uh, percent right. overlap in the list. But I mean underneath that, the, the list is based on, on volume of right. mentions. Right, right. So, so the, the reason for the difference in these lists is the way they calculate whether Either the way they calculate or the way they sample the data. Exactly, and and these differences can range from the time period that they sample, from the range of platforms that they use. Some focus almost exclusively on Twitter and, and public Facebook. Some incorporate the blogosphere in addition to what we're uh, some of you may be using some of these TV check-in platforms, services like GetGlue and things like that. That that data get fed in. Some actually even gather news uh, data from 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 news websites. Uh, so there's all sorts of ways that you could approach this and I, you know, what was important, what was interesting for me was what uh, essentially from the standpoint of say you know, the advertising industry that they realize this is a, a space that's highly fragmented in and of itself right now. Different methodological approaches producing vastly different results uh, and so they're then faced with this challenge of figuring out, and now, and of course, you would like to say, well, let's figure out which of these is most methodologically sound. Uh, and, and the, you know, but that was the other issue we found with this study, that there are very significant methodological details that are all being kept proprietary at this point, not surprising given how competitive this space is. So that challenge of sort of digging underneath the hood and really figuring out which of these folks is doing it well uh, is something that, that, that is tricky. Uh, but anyway, uh, what we, what we, you know, I, you know, it, it, in some ways, some of these numbers are sort of, you know, in this particular case, is a glass half full, glass half empty. It might be open to interpretation. But in these, when you see this incredibly low levels of of, a, of agreement, sort of what counts for liking or not liking a program can, is meaning entirely different things across these different uh, providers. Uh, so, uh, sort. Of 
that was again sort of a, a, a bit of a tangent in some ways, but to, to the larger question. But I thought it was interesting just to, from the standpoint of understanding sort of where this space is in its evolution right now. Uh, and uh, so what I see going forward though in terms of how these issues can then be uh, addressed from the standpoint of, of, of the purpose of this project which is really about trying to evaluate the impact of, of all different kinds of media, uh, you know, not just commercial media but non-commercial media efforts as well. Uh, one that comes up is how might these various sort of commercial measurement systems potentially be repurposed for alternative uses to get beyond answering the questions that perhaps advertisers care about but to the questions that foundations might care about or grantees might care about when it comes to evaluating the success or failure of their work. Um, as I mentioned, the other, what I call this notion of the, of the bl of black box audiences. How, you know, can you really confidently use any of these systems for understanding audiences if there is this little transparency uh, about how they're constructed. Uh, but in on the opportunity side, uh, I think we are really at a bona fide historical moment where um, not unlike what we saw in the 1930s when there was that need for a, a genuine academic industry collaboration to try to understand uh, the nature of the audience. That was what, you know, that radio created. I think um, we are at a very similar point right now where there is this opportunity uh, for those of us who do research in this area to really potentially contribute to the first substantial redefinition of audience value in 30 years. And I say 30 years because I, 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 I put the last sort of major transition back to when we really moved uh, into focusing very explicitly on, on demographics. You know, prior to that, it was more just raw circulation figures, raw you know, viewership figures without parsing out the audience in a demographic way. Um, and then lastly, um, develop mechanisms to support a greater diversity of content providers. That I think that is something that ultimately could emerge from this space if indeed there is w acceptance of uh, and sort of institutionalization of a broader array of criteria for success. Uh, and there seems to be, uh, you know, sufficient demand on, on for, for alternative ways of, 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 of valuing audiences that I think that's, that's something that we're likely to see and it's, it would be a nice thing for uh, those of us who do research in this area to sort of make even a, a stronger contribution to that, to that process. Uh, so thank you and happy to answer any questions. Yes. I have a question. Um, I just threw it down here. When you talk about audience exposure, and I, you know, I presume you're talking about audience exposure to the central content, so like the, the initial show or program, but then what about the audience's exposure to ancillary content that comes out of that, you know, either people that do remixes of songs or people that do re-edits of TV shows or they share, you know, whatever. And then is there any way to measure that and then and how that might bring those people back to the original content? Well, it's interesting you bring that because that's, that's where I, in, in terms of the research that the, the industry sector is doing right now, that's what they're trying to understand first and foremost. And what I find interesting about that is essentially, yes, how do all these more robust ways that audiences engage with content, what I find frustrating is what they want to know is to what extent does that drive them back to the basic thing, the core, the simplistic notion of how many people watched or read or listened. And, and so, you know, I think there are so many other interesting questions to answer with these kind of data other than does you know, social media activity goose ratings, which is really, if, you know, all you see every couple of weeks in the, in the trade press is another study of that. Oh, it's a 1.2% in the 18 to 49s that, you know, and so if, if you've already noticed this, no doubt, that mo television programs are working hard to try to, you know, boost their social media activity, you know, hashtags at the bottom of the screen or, you know, as was happened, what was it, was it the Grammys when Jimmy Kimmel told us all to, uh, to tweet that uh, Tracy Morgan had passed out on stage, you know, but there's, there, there essentially it becomes a, uh, a mechanism to try to drive that, that traditional metric. Um, but, you know, the, so that, I mean, that's, that's my take on, on, on the role that that's playing now. 
it, it seems like there will always be pressure for exposure to be the primary measured mechanism yeah. because that is the broadest level at which things happen. Yep. And since we still don't know very well how you get from exposure all the way to the end point of buying and endorsing a product, you will always be sort of pushing towards, well, let's just measure exposure because that's the, you know, that's the, gives us the biggest denominator. Yes. As it were. Yeah, and it, I don't know how we'll ever get away from it. Well, and that's the thing is every time you move further down the chain, you're lopping off opportunities to monetize people. I mean, even at, you know, I mean, it's already happened in the exposure space. In the television arena, some of you may know, we are, you know the, the system now that works is, is the C3 rating. So it's only commercial viewers that get monetized now. Uh, and if so, if you're watching the show and not watching the commercials, um, you're no longer being monetized. And so, you know, the more you, the further along the process you go, uh, the more exposures you're no longer essentially monetizing. So there's this incredible, exactly, this incredible institutionalized incentive to maintain exposure. And that's why I maintain it as, as the core. Uh, but the counterforce to that is that there are so many in this highly fragmented media environment content providers for whom exposure does not represent a sufficient way uh, to capture revenue to, to, to support themselves. But of course, for that to work, there also then needs to be advertisers and advertising dollars out there that are willing to look beyond exposure. So that complex interaction is ongoing, and, and, there, and there are. Uh, that advertises, I mean, because once again, as, you know, no one is, you know, there's not a massive, you know, 